Good morning, everyone. You can have a seat. Those of you uh, watching online, thanks for uh, being here and being a part of this as well and joining us. Uh, if I haven't met you, my name's Scott. I'm one of the pastors here at The Grove. And uh, today we're starting uh, a brand new series that we've called Take Back Your Life Overcoming Struggles. So today and for the next uh, few weeks, we're going to be looking at um, struggles that we all deal with in different areas of our lives and how we can overcome them. Uh, I titled this uh, one today, The Struggle is Real. Everybody knows that phrase, yes? We've used, yeah, the struggle's real. So I, as soon as that came to mind, then I thought of some of my favorite, you know, pics and memes of the struggle being real. Now these are just meant, this is just, this is lighthearted. You just, just laugh when you see these, whether you think it's funny or not, just, <laughs> just laugh, just, you know, you can practice now if you need to practice. That's Whatever. Here's our first one. Go ahead, roll the clip. Uh, when, when you want flat, crispy bacon and you don't know how to make it happen, but I can tell you, you can skip that. Just put it in the oven. My wife does it every Saturday. It works perfectly. Okay, next. Next. Uh, when your arms are too short and you can't reach anything. And next. Ne there it is. Okay. Th that's questionable. I admit that is questionable, and I almost decided not to, but I'm like, man, I, mean, I laughed out loud when I saw that. So I was like, how can I not? And you know, look at the guy, look at those veins. Are you serious? And the sad thing is, look at the girl. The D doesn't have a chance. Just let it go, buddy. You don't got a chance. And that's happening anyway with her. So just, just let it go. Okay, next, next, next. next. Okay. Uh, when your windshield wipers don't work, but you do have a broom, and it's raining hard, so... The struggle is definitely real. And do we have any more next? Uh, oh yeah, late at night, they're closed, but the drive throughs open, but you don't have a car. So, but you do have cardboard. So make a car out of cardboard and go get your late night, midnight snack through the drive through And uh, the last one, yeah. So this was my son Zane. I forgot to bring him his hat and then that was on me. So then we just had the, the fro go on the rest of the night. Sorry about that, bud. Okay. Um, so today we're talking about, uh, what the heck are we actually talking about? Uh, the struggle is real with work, with work struggles. So you're just going to be thinking about uh, work. Most of us, all of us, one time now or another, we, we're working. And we have various struggles that we deal with uh, when it comes to work. And it reminded me of this story. Uh, some of you have maybe heard it called, uh, it's about two stone builders, uh, this story is about a traveler that came upon these stone uh, masons at work. And, uh, and the traveler walks up to the first stone mason and he asks him this question, do you like your job? He looks up at him and he replies, I've been building this wall for as long as I can remember. The work is monotonous. I work in the scorching hot sun all day. The stones are heavy and lifting them day after day can be backbreaking. I'm not even sure if this project will be completed in my lifetime, but it's a job and it pays the bills. Uh, the traveler thanks him, goes on his way. About 30 feet up ahead, he comes up to a second stonemason, asks him the same question, do you like your job? Second stonemason looks at him and replies, I love my job. I'm building a cathedral. Sure, I've been working on this wall for as long as I can remember, and yes, the work is sometimes monotonous. I work in the scorching hot sun all day. The stones are heavy, and lifting them day after day can be backbreaking. I mean, I'm not even sure if this project is going to be completed in my lifetime, but I'm building a cathedral. So what I love about that story and what I, where I kind of want to go with it here in a little bit is... With both guys in both cases, the struggle is real, the struggle's there, and they both clearly articulate how they're struggling with what they're doing in various ways. But with the second guy, right, his, everything was different, why? Because his perspective on what he was doing, right? He realized, oh, I'm building a cathedral. I mean, it gave him passion, it gave him purpose. He knew what this was about. His perspective made all the difference to how he approached his work, and I, and I would probably guess to say how he even did his work. Uh, all of us here, we all experience struggles with work, right? Whether it's difficult bosses or uh, hard uh, coworkers that you're um, trying to work with, or you have unsatisfied customers, or you have challenging assignments or tedious tasks. 
like what we just read about, or sometimes maybe your uh, rebellion at work is just a, a really hard copy machine. We, uh, so a few years back, we had this copy machine here at the Grove that was just a piece of garbage, you know, and it was just junk. And it would break down all the time. And the first time that it broke down, whoever was like trying to make some copies through it, it, jam, it got all jammed up. And they went to Paul Gunther and they said, hey, can you fix this? And he was smart. And he said, no, I don't, I don't know how to fix that thing. And they're like, okay. And they walked away. And then they came to me and they're like, hey, can you try to, can you fix the copy machine? And I was like, I mean, I don't know, I'll try. And I go there and I, and I clear it all and, it, and, it, and it's cleared and it's fixed and it's working. It's, so guess who they come to now every week when the thing broke down? But I learned my lesson. So try coming at me next time and asking me to fix something. And I know, I've learned, I know what to say. I don't, I don't know anything about that. I don't know what I'm doing. Go, go ask Paul. Okay. Um, he's still going to say no, so that's not going to work. Okay. Uh, work, real quick, before we get to the struggles, we just remember something, right? That work... Work didn't start out as a struggle. Work started out as a good thing. On page one of the Bible, page two of the Bible, God's working, God's creating. God makes Adam and Eve. He's, he uh, creates them to rule over the earth, to uh, subdue the ground, to cultivate it, to bring stuff forth from it. Work was all good. It's all a good thing. The ground, the earth, was to submit to Adam and Eve as they cultivated and produced things from it. And it was to provide for them, right? To take care of their needs as people. And then page three of the Bible, uh, they sin and the fall happens. And as a result of sin and, and evil and pain and struggle and all the things that really entered into our lives and world that has polluted everything, far beyond just your personal little sin, but what has polluted everything uh, resulted in work now being uh, a struggle that we have all experienced and do experience all the time. So we read this in Genesis, uh, what the struggle looks like. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and you ate fruit from the tree that I told, commanded you, you must not eat from. Cursed is the ground because of you through painful toil. There's your struggle. You'll eat food from it all the days of your life. It's going to produce thorns and thistles and you'll eat the plants of the field. So work now is hard. And it's a burden and it's a struggle and we all know it. And uh, yes, he's talking, you know, Adam and Eve and they're, they're gardening and doing things. I, I have a garden. Go ahead and put, I have that garden. Put that garden up at my house. Uh, yeah, in a constant state of rebellion. A constant state of rebellion. This is what's happened as a result of that sin, right? The ground, the earth was supposed to submit to Adam and Eve. They rule over it. It submits to them. But now this curse is, it's in rebellion against them. And I know it's 180 degrees outside, but it looks that way all the time. Just constant, uh, constant rebellion. So work is difficult and hard and full of uh, pain and thorns and everything else. And then there's one other aspect to this. Um, the next verse in Genesis, by the sweat of your brow, you'll eat food until you return to the ground. Since from it you're taken, dust you are, dust you will return. Um, uh, some people just think sweat of the brow just refers to, man, it's just going to be hard work and it's physically hard and it's going to make me sweat. Uh, others say this is an ancient uh, Near Eastern like idiom way of saying that it's actually talking about the anxiety that you feel, the fear that you have of is there going to be enough produces this perspiration, this sweat on your brow. So as you're working and trying to get all the things that you need and hoping that there's going to be enough, it comes from this scarcity mentality, right? Because remember, the ground was to submit to us, but also to provide for us. But now part of this struggle and curse that we're in is, is it going to provide enough, right? And we've all, we've all said things like this. What, what, uh, uh, is this going to be enough money? What, what if, what if my AC breaks this summer and I can't fix it? What if I lose my job? What if I, how am I going to, how am I going to pay for my kids' braces that they need? How, how am I going to pay for my college tuition? Is it going to, I mean, am I going to have enough in retirement someday? Or am I going to have to keep working in this anxiety and fear that we have of, am, am I going to be enough? Am I going to have enough? Am I going to make enough? We all know the answer to the question when people are asked, you know, hey, how much money would be enough money for you to be at peace and be calm? And, whatever? and the answer is always more than I have. Whatever the number is, who cares? It doesn't even matter what the number is. It's just always, man, you know what? Oh, how much do I need so that the anxiety and the fear and everything's gone and I feel I'm well provided? I don't have to worry about anything, just a little more. 
a little more than I am making, a little more than I have right now. It's the scarcity mentality that can produce anxiety and fear in us. So what I want to do today for the rest of our time is just look at four different work struggles that either you're experiencing right now or you have, or maybe you're about to step into one of these because they ebb and flow and they all happen at different times in our lives. But they're, they're not all of the struggles that we experience with work, but they're four pretty common ones that we all probably um, have or will. So here's the first struggle. The first struggle is harsh bosses and managers. Uh, how many of you are a harsh boss? Just kidding, don't raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> harsh bosses and managers. Um, so for many of us, we ha- yes, we understand this a supervisor or whoever it is that's over you that's just heavy-handed, right, and difficult and makes your life miserable and, and hard. So here's what we read in, uh, I think it's, is it Colossians? Go ahead. Yes. Uh, Paul's talking and he says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you to curry their favor, but do it with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It's uh, the Lord Christ that you're serving. So here's the first thing that I want to say about struggle one, harsh bosses and managers. Uh, Remember who you're ultimately working for. If you're in a place where you have a harsh boss, a harsh manager, supervisor, whatever it is, if you're in that place, what's one of the first things that we tend to lose when we have this harsh, difficult boss? Uh, We lose heart, right? It's why Paul says, hey, you know, with sincerity of heart, with all of your heart work as unto the Lord, remember who you're working for. The, The difficult, heavy boss we have will often just crush our heart and we lose our passion for what we're doing. We lose and we learn, we just kind of go through the motions then, right? And we learn how to do that. We know how. We keep our calendars full, a bunch of papers all over the desk. You know, we show up to the right meetings at the right time. Tuck your shirt in. Some of you, tuck your shirt in. If you, if that's, if you have to do that, whatever you think, you know what you need to do to go through the motions, but you've lost heart. Uh, and so how do we get our heart back, this passion, right? I think uh, uh, part of this is we remember who we're ultimately working for. Paul says, you know, it's not this earthly master that you're ultimately working for. So don't just work in a way when their eye is on you, right? Give, put your heart back into this because this ultimately is for the Lord. You're working for him. It reminds me of this. Uh, story. Uh, this is obviously talking about slavery, right? The slaves and earthly masters that we just read. And slavery in uh, ancient Israel and even the Roman Empire was, was different than like modern day slavery before Civil War. But uh, at that time in Maryland, there was a slave, Jacob. His, his master's name was Saunders. And he, he was a cruel master, right? Probably not uncommon uh, at that time in that place. <clears throat> cruel, harsh, difficult, uh, master. And, but Jacob, uh, three times a day, he would stop working. Uh, he was the slave. He would stop working and he would pray. And pr- probably, I mean, my guess, I have no idea, probably following like the example that we see in Daniel. Would, but uh, so obviously this made Saunders pretty upset. And so one day he just kind of had it and Jacob stopped working and he's praying and he comes over and he puts a gun to his head and he says, stop praying and get back to work. And Jacob finishes his prayer and he looks at Saunders and he says, go ahead and pull the trigger because your loss will be my gain. You see, I have two masters. I have Saunders, my earthly master, and I have Jesus, my heavenly master. I have a body and I have a soul. My body belongs to you, but my soul belongs to him. Uh, Saunders, the story says, was so kind of taken back, shooken up by what he said that not only did he not shoot him that day, he never laid another hand on him again. It just kind of did something to him, you know? Uh, 
So that's a cool story. But here's what I even think in that, though. This, we're talking about remembering who you're ultimately working for. Even though he's talking about these two masters, right? I think his, Jacob's, dedication and commitment and loyalty to, to prayer and to defying what Saunders is kind of asking him or telling him to do really speaks to his ultimate devotion to God. Him knowing that there's ultimately one that I'm working for here, and that is that is the Lord. So if you're in a place where you're like, hey, man, yes, the management over me, the whoever over me, the boss, it's just super heavy hand. And yes, I have lost some heart in what I'm doing. Remember who you're working for and ask God to refresh, rejuvenate your heart and your passion for what you are doing. Keep your eyes fixed on him, the one you're ultimately working for. Struggle number two is lazy coworkers. This whole thing gets more awkward as we go. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> lazy coworkers. Uh, I'm probably supposed to say, not that any of you are here, but I don't know, maybe you are. Okay, so here's the passage. Second Thessalonians, love this passage. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from uh, every believer who's idle, that's lazy, and disruptive, that's just sort of gossipy, and does not live according to the teachings that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle or lazy when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. And I said this last hour too, I just want to read that. I just, uh, Kyle Ray's the first, and his name just comes to my mind, if you know who he is, because he will always, he will always let you feed him without him paying for it and eat your food. Oh, but he's, he's great and he's a hard worker, but you never have to ask him twice, Kyle, can I take you out to lunch? Boom, done. Okay, uh, and he's not here today, more importantly. All right, on the contrary, on the contrary, we worked night and day laboring and toiling, so the struggle's still there, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Uh, we did this not because we don't have the right to like ask you to give us food or housing for free, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when, you were, even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who's unwilling to work shall not eat. And we hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They're not busy. Look at this. They're busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. As for you, never tire of doing what is good. So struggle two, lazy coworkers. And the perspective that I want to put before us today is this. Be the worker that you want coworkers to be, right? Be that hardworking, dedicated worker that you wish these lazy or idle or disruptive coworkers that you're around that you wish they would be. That's what Paul says over and over. You know, we did this as an example to you, as a model to you so that you would see it. Lazy coworkers, they're, they're, they tend to be a bit irresponsible. Uh, they're taking advantage of other people. I love how Paul said, right, they're not busy, they're busy bodies. What does that mean? It means that they have their nose everywhere except where it belongs, right? They're, they're, instead of their nose being like in what they need to do and in their work, their nose is in everybody else's business. It's in your business. It's, you know, gossiping about this. It's in, you know, your department, your area that has nothing to do with them, uh, I, I have some, I have a child or maybe some children like this, you know, at times where, where they'll say, oh, so, so and so, he broke the remote uh, to, the, to the thing. And I'm like, why are you telling me that he broke the remote? Oh, because he broke the remote and I just thought you'd want to know. No, you don't care that he, he could burn the house down. You would care less. You don't care that he broke the remote. You're just tattling, hoping that he's going to get in trouble. Isn't that right? Yeah. Okay. Well, where does your nose belong? On my face. That's right. Your nose belongs on your face, not over in that other business that has nothing to do with you. So why don't you go in your room for 10 minutes, and then I'll come check on you and see if your nose is back on your face or if you left it laying around the house somewhere else, and uh, we'll figure out how to get it back on your face. Paul... Um, this is what Paul says about these 
lazy coworkers, right? And, uh, and you know, uh, we understand what he's saying here, but, but this wonderful challenge to us, because it's hard, and the truth is, we're maybe even tempted. We see them acting that way, being irresponsible, not, you know, doing things, and it's like, man, why don't, why don't I just do that, right? Well, it's, it's tempting to kind of step in and join them. But Paul's instruction for us here is very clear to be like, nope, keep working hard. Keep, you don't want to be a burden to other people. Keep working hard. Be the faithful worker that you want and wish that they would be, right? And as you, and as they see that in you, and as you encourage them to step up their game, uh, imitate to them, be a model, be an example to them of the worker uh, that, they, that you wish that they would be. All right, struggle number three, waste of time, right? Where you feel like, man, I just, I don't know what or why I'm doing this. I'm spinning my wheels. I feel like I'm going nowhere fast. Does any of the stuff that I'm doing even matter? Uh, in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul says this, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, uh, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Fully, because you know that your labor, which will include struggle by definition, right? This, the, the struggle doesn't vanish, but your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's not for nothing. It's not empty. It has eternal impact to it. So here's what we're saying about our waste of time. Work is never wasted when it's done for God. That's what Paul says. Uh, give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Our work is never wasted when it's done for God. And I know what some of you are maybe thinking. Maybe thinking, well, that's great, <clears throat> and that's good, uh, but I'm, you know, I write up proposals, or I make pizzas, or I inspect homes. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not someone that's, uh, a full-time pastor at a church or something, or, or a chaplain, or some Bible teacher at a Christian school, or I don't work for some nonprofit that's, you know, doing great, good, Christian, godly work in some other place around the world, or I'm not on some, you know, translation team, translating this in some language to some tribe, you know, halfway around the world or, or something. And, and I get that, but remember what Paul said again. He said, give yourselves fully, fully, to the work of the Lord, right? And if I were to ask you, hey, do you think that Paul, the Apostle Paul, that he gave himself fully to the work of the Lord, you would all say, yeah, of course you would. And you'd be right. You'd be right. But let me remind you something about Paul. Go to Acts, please. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, who was a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. I know that you didn't follow all that. Don't worry about it. Uh, can you go back one? Uh, okay, Paul went, thank you, thank you. Paul went to see them, and here's the point. And because he was a tent maker, what did Paul do? He made, he made tents. As they were, he stayed and he worked with them. What do you think he did when he worked with them? He made tents. Why did he make tents? He's a tent maker? Correct. Yeah, correct. You're, you guys are fast. You are quick this Labor Day weekend. Just thank you for being here, by the way. I half expected to walk into an empty room. So just thank you for being in town and even being here today. God bless you. Every Sabbath... Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, uh, teaching them the word of God. So did Paul teach the Bible? Yeah, yeah, we read that. Yeah, teaching them, teaching them the Bible. He's teaching them the Bible. Um, uh, was he going to the synagogue and just having conversations with people, explaining kind of scriptures, talking about who God is, talking about scripture, answering questions, asking questions? Yep, yep, he did all that. And what else was he doing for work that we know of? He's making tents. He's a tent worker. So now go back to what Paul said. You, not, you don't have to go on the on slide, but go back in your head to what Paul said. Give yourselves fully, fully 
to the work of the Lord. What did fully look like for Paul? Making tents, making tents, and like going to the synagogue and talking to people, just having conversations with people about who God is. Making tents and teaching people the Bible. Uh, were those two separate compartmentalized things and they don't know? No, I think he just, I think Paul saw his tent making as part of his work for the Lord. So he can just say, hey, give yourselves fully to God and know that it's never wasted what you do for God. So you're making pizzas or inspecting homes or writing up proposals. Great, great. How is that a part of what you're doing for God? How are you inviting God into that space? Or better said, God's already in that space. How are you seeing God and looking to God in that space and including him in what you're doing and just asking God to use you in all of that and bring about work that is fully devoted to the Lord? Because as we read in this passage, Give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor, your struggle in the Lord is not in vain. Your work is never wasted when it's done for God. So invite God into those spaces. Look for God in those places. Um, allow him to use you in all of the ways that he wants to use you to do uh, his work in this world. And struggle number four, the last one, is exhausting tasks. And some of you, I mean, some of you, this is definitely where you are, right? You're, you're exhausted. Your you're, you're workload, the stress, the amount that you're given to do, the, it's, it's more than what you can do in the time that you're given to work, right? 40 hours, 50 hours, doesn't matter. You're just like, I can't fit it. I'm exhausted just trying to keep up with this. And I just want to remind us of a passage in Exodus, Six days do your work, and on the seventh day, uh, don't do work, so that your ox and your donkey may rest. Now, think about this. My, I, unless you have an ox or a donkey, which some of you may, you look like you might, but most of you probably don't. Unless you have an ox or donkey, but still, what's the point there? When we rest, it allows other people to rest. Oh, wait, go back. There's more. Wait, there, but wait, there's more. Okay. Uh, allow your ox and donkey that they may rest and so that the slave born in your household and your foreigner, the foreigner living among you, that they may be refreshed. Okay, so exhausting tasks. And here we just want to say about that. Know when to stop working and rest with God. And I made sure it's really important that we don't miss the last three words there. Rest with God. Because I'm not just talking about taking a day off. That's good. That's great. Take a day off. But a day off isn't the exact same thing as a Sabbath. Because the idea of a Sabbath is, yes, we stop working. Uh, that is, we stop producing and striving and doing and getting anxious and fearful and wondering, is it going to be enough? Am I even enough? Do I have enough in retirement? How am I going to pay for this? Am I going to get the groceries this week? Right? We stop our work. We stop doing what we're doing, but, we, but we're resting with God. That's key because we're allowing God during that time to refresh us, to restore us. And really, this whole Sabbath thing, it kind of brings all of this together because when we stop working and we rest with God, we also look back uh, to the work that we have done. And we're remembering things like, God, you are the one that I'm ultimately working for. Because next week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step in to that hard boss again. You are the one that I'm ultimately working for. And, and we remember that, you know, God, man, there's some, there's some people that are just lazy and they're driving me crazy that I work with and I just, I don't even know what to do with them. <clears throat> but God, would you help me to be faithful and to keep working hard in the midst of their laziness and their thing, busybodiness that they have going on. Help me to work hard and be an example and a model to them. And, and God, would you continue to, to help me see you in everything that I'm doing, that I would give myself fully to you, that I would be reminded that I am not wasting my time and what I'm doing. Because man, this, this past week, I just felt like I was spinning my wheels, getting nowhere. But work done for you is never in vain. God, would you do that in me? 
So I, I want to just close by giving you a moment to just invite God into whatever one of these spaces you might be in at this time. So if you would just kind of bow your head with me, I'm going to pray us out. Uh, <clears throat> but before I do that, let me just walk you through these. And maybe you're at a time right now where you have a, a harsh boss or manager or supervisor that's over you that's making your job very difficult. And you've noticed that you're, you're this harsh boss, you've lost your heart. And so would you just be reminded, invite God into that space. Be reminded that God is ultimately the one that you're working for and ask him to refresh your heart. Maybe you have some difficult coworkers or people that are just driving you crazy that you don't even know what to do with. And can you just invite God to help you be the faithful worker that you want them to be? And maybe you don't, you don't know what, where, or why you're doing what you're doing, and it all feels like a waste of time. And would you just ask God to help you see him, find him in the place of your work, to devote and devote yourself fully to him. and know that what you're doing is never wasted when it's done for God. And for those of you that are exhausted with a pretty stressful job that's wearing you out, would you take time even now to rest, to ask God to give you peace, to remove your anxiety and fear and stress and to fill you with his spirit. Father God, thank you for the gift of work. We don't always think of work as a gift but we're reminded today that it's a good thing. And with all these struggles that we are trying to navigate through, some of them heavier than others, God, would you be with each person here? Help, help each person to find you and to see you in whatever place they're in with their work, whatever they need. God, would you show up in that way and would we, would we uh, do whatever it is that we do? Would we do it for you? God, would you be honored by that? And as a church, would we continue to be your people, blessing those around us, doing our best, loving our coworkers, blessing our world, we pray.